Hello, and welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I'm Allison Ganpel, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement at York University. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lecture, International Treaties and How They Mostly Fail to Produce Their Intended Effects, with Dr. Mathieu Poirier, Assistant Professor of Social Epidemiology in our School of Kinesiology. Before we begin, I accept the responsibility to acknowledge the land that I'm on. And because we're not all gathered in the same place, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be for the territory you're on. Please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you're on. The website nativeland.ca is a good resource for this. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuckeronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Now we like to conduct a quick poll before each session begins. So the question is, how would you rate your knowledge regarding the topic of today's presentation? The poll should pop up on your screen and I'll give everyone a moment to respond. I know I'm certainly excited to learn, uh, to learn what our professor has to say. Thank you very much. It's always helpful to us to have a sense about who's in our audience and um, what our level of knowledge is. And it looks like it's, you know, all across the board. So I'm sure we'll we'll all learn a lot today. Okay, so I know we've been on Zoom for a long time, but if you do need any help with the Zoom webinar, please feel free to click on the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. We've got a team that's ready to help you. And that same button can be used to submit questions for our guest speaker who will answer them during the Q&A period that will follow today's presentation. I'll ask them on your behalf. So if questions come up as you're hearing the talk, please feel free to type them in and I'll answer them if it, they haven't been addressed once we get to the end. So do note please that all of your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and to our staff working behind the scenes. So please keep your comments relevant and respectful. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, I am ready to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Poirier. Mathieu Poirier is the co-director at the Global Strategy Lab, and he's a tier two York research chair in global health, in global health equity, an assistant professor of social epidemiology at the School of Global Health at York University. That was hard to pronounce, so um, sounds very important and impactful. Um, his research ranges from evaluating international law to developing health equity metrics and generating policy relevant research on socially and politically determined inequities in health. We are so pleased that you could make time to join us today. Welcome, Dr. Poirier. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Allison. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Thanks for spending your lunch with me. I'm gonna to try to pull up my slides now. Hopefully this works. Perfect. So you pull up your slides. I'm going to go off camera and uh, I'll be back after the presentation. Okay. Uh, if you could, yeah, just please let me Perfect. know if you can we see can the see screen. It. We can All see right. it. So uh, today I'll be presenting a uh, an article uh, titled International Treaties Have Mostly Failed to Produce Their Intended Effects. Uh, now I've kind of given away the main finding here in the title, but we're going to go through systematically uh, how we came to that conclusion, uh, and uh, it's all detailed in a publication that was uh, just released in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science. So once again, I'm Mathieu Poirier, the co-director of the Global Strategy Lab. And the plan for today, uh, quite simple, we're going to start out with the question, well, why study international law at all? We'll then go into whether or not treaties have achieved uh, their intended effects. And again, you may have a, a good guess as to what the uh, conclusion is for that question. And uh, we'll finish up with some implications for international law, and then I'll be happy to address any questions you may have. So uh, starting out with why study international law at all? Uh, and something that surprises quite a few people is that there is actually over 
250,000 treaties addressing uh, all sorts of issues, things like environmental issues, human rights, humanitarian crises, maritime issues, security and trade. Some are treaties that are um, between uh, over 100 countries. Others are bilateral, trilateral treaties between just a few countries. Uh, there's uh, many different kinds and scales of treaties. And uh, surprisingly, they're not being systematically evaluated. Uh, and uh, so we don't actually know quantitatively whether they're producing their intended effects, when they're producing their intended effects, and what kind of factors actually uh, create more effective treaties. And so despite this lack of knowledge, uh, leaders from government, academia, business, civil society, they routinely call for new treaties uh, to address global challenges. Uh, you'll see on the right hand side uh, just a, a few different selected um, uh, calls for treaties. Uh, some are for global health governance, others are for um, uh, fighting fake drugs, for um, uh, public policy more generally, for obesity control, for alcohol control. Uh, and uh, more recently, we have a pandemic treaty that's being negotiated. Uh, we also have one on the horizon dealing with plastics just to say that there are calls for new treaties all the time, despite the fact that we don't have really strong quantitative evidence about what makes a, uh, an effective treaty. Uh, and so that is really what uh, was behind the decision to uh, investigate this in the first place. And just to say that this is one treaty we're keeping a close eye on, uh, the International Pandemic Treaty. Uh, this is currently being negotiated, so we're hoping that the findings of this study will inform uh, negotiations like this one. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is how international law actually works, because it's uh, not so straightforward. Uh, there's no uh, global international uh, body that uh, passes laws, enforces them, uh, collects taxes like there is at, at the national level. So the way that these actually work are through mechanisms like agenda setting, legal language, political pressure, social mobilization, and trade pressure. And those can flow either through national policy, so you can have a treaty, and then a government can decide to, uh, to ratify it into law. Uh, it can go directly into subnational policies. So um, uh, maybe a, a, a subnational entity like Ontario can say directly, oh, we see what's happening internationally. We're going to pass something in a policy. Or it can actually go directly uh, and uh, affect people, places, and products without any change in policy at all. So uh, treaties like the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control that were, was negotiated and, uh, and uh, adopted in 2003, it may have actually had direct impacts on people's behavior and their smoking behavior without any change in policy at all. So all that to say that it's a complex uh, phenomenon and we have to take into account all these different mechanisms. So with that complexity, what did we decide to do? We decided to uh, conduct a systematic review of all quantitative impact valuations of an international treaty involving more than two countries. So that involved uh, browsing uh, many electronic databases. We assessed uh, the studies that passed uh, inclusion criteria using Cochrane's Robbins One tool for non-randomized studies. That's just to say that we assessed it for quality. And at the end of the day, we ended up screening through 24,096 uh, abstracts, uh, of which uh, we eventually included 82 uh, studies that uh, could be included in meta-analysis. And we could include them because they had enough reporting of their findings, of uh, effect sizes, and of variance that we could include it in meta-analysis. But we also supplemented that with another 142 studies that had qualitative information that we could use to uh, support what was coming out of those meta-analyses. And I'll come back to exactly what we did with those later. Uh, so some of the things we're looking for in these studies uh, were different treaty characteristics that we could use in our analysis. These are things like uh, what policy domain it's intended to act on. Uh, we uh, looked at a few different domains. They looked like trade and finance treaties, human rights treaties, maritime treaties, so just different categories. Uh, we looked at the size and type of negotiating forum, whether it was a small or large forum, uh, UN body, economic cooperation forum, human rights. Uh, we looked at the year of treaty adoption, uh, pre-1970, 1970 to 1989, post-1990. What kinds of outcomes are being evaluated? Uh, economic, social, civil liberties outcomes. Uh, 
And we also looked at the stage of evaluation. And this actually goes from earliest to latest. So first countries sign on to a treaty. They then get ratified into law. And then at a later point, they come into legal force within countries or subnational governments. And the final thing that we really wanted to take a close look at is what we call accountability mechanisms or different uh, tools that you can use within a treaty to make uh, them more effective. And they go from uh, the, the, the weakest type of accountability mechanism at the top to the strongest type on the bottom. So we looked at transparency mechanisms, which is sharing information to observers through regular reporting and information aggregation. So just sharing what's happening regularly. An oversight mechanism, uh, which is monitoring and evaluating through standard setting and implementation review. So not just reporting information, but someone's actually going through and, uh, and seeing what's happening, comparing country by country data, and uh, perhaps putting out a report. And a complaint mechanism uh, where a grievance can be processed and adjudicated through country or secretariat complaint mechanisms. So one country could say, this other country is not doing what they promised to do, and then that can get escalated for public review. And finally, an enforcement mechanism. And this is where a sanction or consequence can be delivered by a court, a committee, secretariat, or other legal authority. Uh, that could be something like uh, imposing financial penalties on a country, sanctions, uh, perhaps expelling them from a trade body or other treaty body. Uh, there's an actual consequence for not following through with what you promise in uh, a treaty. So that's what we're looking for. That's a general idea. I'll go into a few more specifics of what we actually did to analyze all this information. But just to emphasize that uh, this study, uh, again, recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, uh, has taken 10 years uh, from conception to publication. We've involved uh, 31 co-authors who come from a wide variety of disciplines from international law, epidemiology, health policy, uh, all sorts of different perspectives and backgrounds. Uh, we analyzed a total of 224 studies, screened through 24,096 records, and uh, it's the first systematic field-wide evidence synthesis uh, evaluating the, uh, the impacts of all international law. So it, it's a really a major achievement. So I've gone through what we did to actually find our studies, our data, uh, but then we actually had to prepare it for analysis. And obviously we're looking at a wide variety of treaties that are evaluate that are in, <laughs> impacting a wide variety of outcomes. So to make them comparable, what we did is we converted all of the quantitative outcomes to Z statistics to allow for direct comparison. And then those were coded to either uh, a treaty's intended outcome uh, in a positive direction or opposite of the intended outcome in a negative direction. We then conducted meta-analysis. So we were essentially asking which factors are associated with treaties achieving their intended effects within 16 subgroups of interests. And those are the different factors that we're looking at that I was going through in the earlier slides. Uh, we did that with a chi-square test of heterogeneity. And finally, we did a meta-regression where we looked at which factors combine across all the subgroups to produce intended effects. And we did that that through a random effects meta regression. So finally, I'm going to start to present some results, uh, and uh, starting with the really primary result, uh, and that is that only trade and finance treaties produce significant intended impacts according to our analysis. So let me tell you how to interpret this chart you're seeing. You'll see the standardized effect size, which is a Z statistic on the uh, X axis. Uh, there's a point estimate there. There's a number of outcomes that are actually evaluated in every category uh, with the n equals. And then the bars you see are a 95% confidence interval. So if they cross that dotted line, that zero dotted line, that means that there's no uh, significant effect in either direction. If the bars are clear of that dotted line, that means that there is a significant impact. So going down the line, environmental treaties, human rights treaties, humanitarian treaties, maritime treaties, security treaties, all of those are pretty close to zero and our uncertainty crosses zero. So essentially we're saying there's no significant impact uh, when uh, looking at all of these quantitative evaluations. The only treaties where we do see it go into that positive zone 
is trade and finance treaties. You see that there's 86 of those. Those are definitely statistically significant in the intended direction. Now, there's a few different ways of slicing this up, and they all essentially confirm this primary outcome. Uh, one way is by looking at impacts on people, places, policies, or products. We see, again, very similarly, uh, changes in people, places, policies. Uh, they're all crossing that dotted line, no significant impact. Uh, change in products, uh, that one is significant. Or another way of looking at it is by the outcome evaluated. It's a little cut off there, but uh, civil liberty outcomes, social outcomes, no significant effect. Economic out outcomes, yes, a uh, significant effect in the positive direction. Uh, another way of looking at it is by the negotiating venue. Again, uh, economic cooperation venues are achieving their impacts. Human rights venues, UN venues, not uh, actually achieving significant impacts. And if we kind of drill down to the underlying data to see what's happening on a treaty by treaty basis, uh, this uh, depressing finding actually gets uh, even a, a bit worse. Uh, you'll see that these uh, treaties that are uh, highlighted in the orange box, these are the ones that had the uh, lowest standardized effect sizes. And you'll see that on average, they're actually negative, which means that uh, if we're looking at the average quantitative evaluation, the opposite of what they're trying to do is happening. So if I go down and read through what these are, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, uh, the American and European Conventions on Human Rights, the Convention Against Torture, the Geneva Conventions, you'll, uh, you can imagine that if the opposite of what these treaties are trying to achieve is actually happening, these are really bad things. These are uh, outcomes that uh, are the base human rights. And if we're not actually achieving impacts with these, uh, this is a real problem. So other results, um, we also looked at venue size and year of treaty adoption. You'll see that small uh, treaties with five or fewer countries uh, were uh, probably more impactful than larger treaties with over 100 countries signing on. Now, uh, there's a lot of overlap uh, with smaller treaties being primarily trade and finance treaties, so it's hard to disentangle that, uh, but generally that trend is, is showing up. Uh, same with post-1990 treaties potentially being more effective, but also these are uh, largely trade and finance treaties, so again, hard to disentangle that. Uh, we also looked at time of evaluation. So again, signing happens first, and then countries ratify, and then it goes into legal force. So uh, interestingly, uh, those that were evaluated immediately at the time of treaty signing saw larger impacts, which is interesting, and I'll come back to this later. Uh, another uh, primary finding is those accountability mechanisms that I went through earlier. And I'm actually going to only look at the non-trade and non -trade and finance treaties uh, in this chart. Uh, because for trade and, uh, trade and finance treaties, uh, actually all of the accountability mechanisms worked. There was no uh, difference between them. But if we narrow our focus to only those that are not trade and finance treaties, you'll see that enforcement mechanisms are the only ones that are really showing promise of being more effective. Uh, all the others are just centered on that zero line. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that there are only seven outcomes that did have enforcement mechanisms. So our sample size is rather limited here, so it's hard to draw a really strong conclusion. Uh, moving on to the meta-regression results. So again, this is where we combine all the factors together. We're no longer looking at uh, one factor at a time. We're combining everything into one analysis. When we do that, uh, you're uh, probably not going to be surprised. Very similar results. The thing that mattered the most is whether a treaty was governing trade and finance. Uh, the second factor that, uh, that showed up most often in different models was that uh, short-term normative effects, those early evaluations, those also produced more uh, positive intended effects. Uh, and accountability mechanisms don't appear to independently drive treaty effectiveness. That could be because of that small sample size that we have to work with, um, uh, but it's hard to say at this point. So those are the results. Uh, and then we had to think through, okay, what does this actually mean for international law? 
Uh, and the first one, uh, and this is kind of the headline finding, is that unfortunately most treaties appear to be failing. Uh, and when I was going through that, those treaty by treaty impacts, just to even go one level uh, further, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, for example, was associated with worsened human rights practices, no improvements in health outcomes, and paradoxically increases in child labor. So clearly not the impacts that uh, we're hoping for with a treaty like this. Uh, and uh, people often ask, you know, how could this possibly happen? Uh, countries are signing on. Why is the opposite happening? Uh, one uh, idea out there in the literature that we've come across is that it could be caused by something that's called the paradox of empty promises. This is a, a situation in which repressive governments can seek diplomatic rewards for signing on to treaties uh, while facing few consequences for failures to comply with treaty provisions. So you sign on to a treaty like the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and then you uh, don't change your practices at all, or you may even worsen them with that cover, uh, and you get the diplomatic uh, praise from other countries saying, oh, uh, we're glad you signed on. Uh, but once they realize that things are not changing, there may not be any consequence for actually not following through. The other main finding is that uh, trade and finance treaties do appear to be working. Regardless of the accountability mechanisms in the treaty, the year the treaty was adopted, the stage of treaty evaluation, uh, these treaties consistently achieve their intended effects. Uh, now, that may be because the outcomes are more easily measurable. That's something that we, um, that we put out there in the manuscript. Uh, but even among social and civil liberties outcomes, so those outcomes that aren't directly in the policy uh, domain that we'd expect for trade and finance treaties, uh, the uh, general agreement on tariffs and trade was associated with two of those largest impacts. So it's uh, probably not entirely just a, a measurement issue. Uh, there do appear to be quite few promising design choices when it comes to designing more effective treaties. Uh, enforcement mechanisms are the only modifiable treaty design choice with the potential to improve treaty effectiveness for those non-trade and finance treaties. Uh, however, it's only present in two of the 32 non-trade and finance treaties that we analyzed in this, in this study. So that would be things, again, like prescribing financial sanctions on states or expelling states from treaty bodies and trade blocks. Uh, year of treaty adoption and size of negotiating venue, again, that's later years and smaller sizes, may also improve treaty effectiveness, but those effects are likely driven by trade and finance treaties, and generally they're, they're not that modifiable. You can't fully control what's happening with the venue or how many countries are signing on. Uh, stage of evaluation also appears to matter. So we found this pretty interesting. Uh, the treaty impacts appear to be more driven by immediate normative and socialization processes that happen immediately at the time of treaty adoption and negotiation. And that appears to be more important than long-term legal processes. So that would be after ratification coming into legal force, uh, which is kind of the opposite of what many people would assume. And so that means that the treaty negotiation and signing process itself uh, may be a really important opportunity for governments to maximize treaty impacts. The more that people are paying attention to these negotiations, the more that public uh, uh, interest, civil society, uh, different actions are being mobilized at that time of treaty signing, that may be in and of itself a really important factor. So uh, just to wrap everything up, uh, more research definitely needed to understand how these different mechanisms can be effectively deployed to achieve intended impacts. Uh, we uh, say that calls for new international treaties to address global challenges beyond trade and finance without enforced mechanisms should be received with caution. Uh, and this really has direct implications for the new pandemic treaty, uh, for the Paris Climate Accord, for the uh, upcoming negotiations on treaties governing plastics and all sorts of other things. And essentially we're saying that uh, you need some kind of strong enforcement mechanism in these treaties uh, if you want them to produce their intended effects. And if that means that fewer countries will sign on to them, that actually may be a trade-off worth making. Uh, so uh, that's where I'll uh, leave it for now.
and uh, I will uh, turn it over to Allison. Thank you so much, Dr. Poirier. That was super interesting, moderately depressing, um, but uh, wow, what a, you know, what an amount of work that you've done in looking through all that research. I think you said over, over 10 years and with so much data to really, you know, get an understanding and for us to know, um, you know, that, that what we, you know, what, what international um, governments are doing isn't necessarily working. So at this point, we have time for questions and some questions have already come in. Um, you can see them in, uh, in the Q&A section, but for our audience, if you would like to um, add a question, please use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. I'll ask, those on your, I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, for any of our guests who are watching live on Facebook, you're welcome to submit any questions or comments that you have through the comment section for the video. So, Let's see where let's see where we're going to start. Um, let's start with um, with the first question that came in, and it came in from um, Lucian. And so, thank you, Lucian, for being the first to send a question. Lucian, and I, I hope I've pronounced the name right, asks: Given the extent of failure of treaties, why do entities continue to devote time to compiling them? Well, uh, I guess. The first uh, aspect of that is that there hasn't been a similar study in the past that's looked at all of these uh, treaties and produced one uh, one effect uh, that could be uh, compared across different policy domains. So this kind of uh, information really wasn't available before. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of discussion about uh, the possibility that this could be happening, especially in political science literature and in international law lit uh, literature, where people were looking at uh, many different treaties, probably not achieving their intended effects, uh, and saying we need to be a bit more critical of these. Uh, but uh, before this study, there hasn't been this kind of uh, systematic global uh, uh, review of everything that's happening to be able to actually have this as a baseline to start that conversation. So uh, that's one answer. But the other is that uh, this isn't to say that we need to stop global cooperation. There are many issues that need coordinated action across, uh, across national boundaries. Uh, for example, antimicrobial resistance is one issue that we are studying at the Global Strategy Lab. And we, uh, we know that we need coordination so that uh, there's not a set of countries that are taking action to deal with, with this issue and another set of countries that aren't. Because at the end of the day, if not every country is uh, working to reduce uh, antimicrobial resistance, everyone will pay for it. So uh, uh, global cooperation is needed. And we want these treaties to work. And that's why we're trying to uh, find ways to make them more effective. And that's why we're recommending that uh, enforcement mechanisms be considered. And maybe we need to learn uh, from what's happening in those trade and finance treaties and work in new strategies. Uh, or maybe we need more attention paid to that uh, negotiation and signing process. Uh, these are all just to start this conversation and to say that we really need to do more. Thank you for that. I think that answered Lucian's second question, which was about, um, you know, why would treaties be compiled if there isn't an enforcement mechanism uh, as a part of that? I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add to, to you know, to the part about enforcement um, or if we're just, again, as at the beginning of that conversation. Yeah, just to say that it's not completely unreasonable for that mechanism to uh, to work. Uh, again, international law doesn't function like uh, we typically expect national law to work. Uh, you know, if a country doesn't comply, it's not like Interpol comes knocking on their door and then uh, arrests uh, someone, the president. That that doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, naming and shaming uh, is one strategy that's often used. Uh, you point to a country, say, you know, these, uh, for example, human rights violations are happening. Uh, we're going to actually make this public and put public pressure on you to change. Uh, that could happen, and that's something that's relied upon often. Uh, but if we look again in non-trade and finance treaties uh, across all policy domains, we're not seeing the intended effects that we would hope to see with that kind of approach. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read um, the question that is being asked by Sam, and um, it's, it's a longer one, so I'll read it. Uh, it seems like major powerful countries like the US 
are able to flout the terms of agreements they have entered into. For example, unilaterally withdrawing from a nuclear treaty with Iran. The US is also not signatory to international court. So how can such countries be compelled to abide by the agreement they've entered into? Yeah, I think I'll give it a two-part answer to this as well. <laughs> So uh, some data I didn't pre uh, present, and that is not in this manuscript, because <laughs> we have so much uh, data analysis that we're going to be releasing it in several manuscripts. Uh, we have looked at whether uh, whether major powers on a, on a global level signing onto a, a given treaty uh, might make it more effective or less effective. And generally, that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, so that's not really a, another mechanism that is behind all this. And we considered that it's probably not that, uh, you know, whether the US, Russia, China signing on matters. Uh, and if they don't, it, it doesn't. That doesn't appear to be happening. Uh, but that's not to say that countries that don't sign on to treaties can't be compelled to change. And uh, I'll go back to the example of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, the US was not a signatory to that, uh, but uh, things uh, probably did actually change for the better in that country because of the attention that was being paid by civil society, uh, by subnational governments, uh, by uh, just the general population to what was happening on a global level. And again, international law can work through those mechanisms. Uh, people are understanding the harms of tobacco smoke. They're understanding that smoke-free workplaces are important to have, and they can advocate for those changes, even if national governments don't sign on to treaties. So that's not to say that uh, they, the treaties can't work in countries where they're not signatories, uh, because they, they, they sometimes can. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, you know, there, there's so much complexity to this that it's sort of, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a really interesting issue to be discussing. I'll, uh, I'll turn to the next question um, that Lucian asked, uh, which is when entities are discussing treaties, would the agreement to a standard tre treaty format, like component chapters, reduce the number of unenforceable treaties or the likelihood of, su of success? Why or why not? That's an interesting question, and we're starting to get into uh, the, the the depth of international law that's a bit outside my expertise. We do have international lawyers on the research team, but that's not my training, so I'll do the best I can to address it, uh, which is, if, if I'm guessing, countries probably wouldn't uh, uh, like starting from a standard uh, boilerplate uh, uh, format uh, because every country is going to be approaching negotiations with their own interests and every uh, issue will have different actors at the table, different uh, uh, economic players, civil society, again, that are going to influence it in different ways. Uh, so even if we find mechanisms that generally are more effective than others, um, starting every negotiation from a standard format I, I'm guessing is probably a, a, a non-starter, but it's an interesting idea and something I'll, I'll go back to my team and ask them what they, what they think about it. Wonderful, that's, uh, that's neat when some ideas are generated from um, the discussions we can have here. I'll turn it to um, the last question that we have here in the chat, so if, in the Q&A, so if anyone does have additional questions, now would be the time to put them into the Q&A before I turn to some of our questions. Um, so Lucian asks, if a treaty isn't respected, can it still be referred to as cooperation? Yeah, uh, it's a provocative question. I, I think appropriately so. Uh, in some cases, if we go back to that paradox of empty promises, uh, treaties likely aren't actually being used for uh, to cooperate with other countries. They're being used more as cover, more as a geopolitical uh, a bargaining chip, more or less, to say that, uh, you know, we're going to sign on to this. We may not follow our promises. And even if you name and shame us, even if you uh, make this information public that we're not following through on what we promised to do, um, uh, it matters more to us that we're seen to be signing on. Maybe there's a ceremony, maybe there's uh, you know, immediate trade implications for the country that does that. Uh, all to say that there may be more positives for this performative gesture uh, than actual intent to follow through. So uh, I, I don't think you're wrong. Thank you. Good perspective. 
So Linda's asking um, more into the tactics. Does it matter who proposes the treaty? Um, so the negotiating venue uh, did seem to matter. Uh, we separated out by economic cooperation forums. So things like, uh, and here again, I'm getting a, a bit out of my depth as someone who's not trained in international law, but um, uh, trade blocks uh, like uh, the WTO, like uh, other economic uh, forums, those all seem to work quite well, quite consistently. Uh, so those uh, definitely do seem to be achieving their intended effects. We then separated out UN bodies from uh, independent human rights uh, groups. So these can be, uh, I believe, the Inter-American uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Organization. I probably have that acronym wrong. Uh, there's a European one uh, as well. Those also seem to not produce their intended effects. Uh, so both the UN and the independent human rights uh, organizations. So it does seem to matter what kind of venue these are being negotiated in. Thank you for that. So thinking about your research, what would you say were some of the most surprising results obtained by the team and how will this shape future research on the evaluation of international laws? So uh, one really interesting effect is the, 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 the one that needed a bit of uh, explaining that uh, impacts at the time of treaty signing do seem to really matter and that uh, later effects, once they come into legal force within countries, seem to matter less. Uh, we found that really interesting at the lab because uh, we have a stream of research that we call global legal epidemiology, uh, where we apply uh, epidemiologic tools to uh, evaluate international law. Uh, so this is one of those treaties, but we also conduct our own independent empirical evaluations. And we internally had debates, you know, do we uh, investigate the impacts of treaties immediately as they're being signed, as they're being uh, actually uh, put into national law, or as they're actually coming into force? And we internally decided it probably matters more at the time of signing. Uh, and uh, we based that off literature and what our analyses were telling us. And this finding really confirmed that, that our approach is the appropriate one. Uh, and it's quite tricky when you're evaluating things globally because there's no counterfactual earth. So we have to use things like uh, quasi-experimental methods to more or less uh, create a fictional comparison earth. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in this work, uh, check out what we do at the Global Strategy Lab. There's going to be follow-up studies, uh, including one focused specifically on uh, human rights law. Uh, and uh, commentaries as well. So keep an eye on uh, on our website, on our Twitter feed, and uh, we'll be uh, having some more results coming out uh, in the months to come. I have no doubt that we will all be um, following up on this. It's uh, certainly very interesting. Um, Lucian's asking some more questions. Um, I'll, I'll ask these last two questions, and then uh, and then and then we will have to wrap up, unfortunately, in just a couple of minutes. Um, question is, are treaties between blocks more difficult to negotiate than between uh, independent entities? And then they also ask, do all treaties have force in international law? So I'll let you think about those two. Yeah. So in general, uh, if you're trying to get an entire block to sign on, uh, that's certainly going to be more difficult than a uh, what's referred to as a club treaty that you just have like minded countries come together, agree to something. It's not so complicated. Uh, but if you're trying to get entire blocks to sign on to something, uh, you'll usually have a holdout country or two that wants uh, maybe something completely different or even just uh, some language changed, maybe weakened to allow them to sign on without uh, potentially repercussions for not following through. So again, uh, this study says that that trade-off is probably not worth making, that you probably want to have a stronger version of a treaty rather than having more countries sign on. Uh, so that club approach is probably the better one if it means you're able to negotiate a stronger uh, treaty. And uh, in terms of uh, force in international law, uh, we saw that for those non-trade non and finance treaties, only I believe it was two of the 32 uh, had an enforcement mechanism, which means that that strongest way of keeping countries uh, accountable was not present in the vast majority. Uh, so uh, in trade and finance treaty, that was not the case. Uh, quite a few of them do have that strong enforcement mechanism. Uh, 
uh, something uh, that uh, we need to be aware of, that most treaties are just uh, rely on naming and shaming. They rely on countries voluntarily complying. And uh, moving forward, uh, this study says that we need to uh, reconsider that approach. Got it. So drilling into um, the research and, and the work that, that you do, where do you see the research of international treaties headed? You know, now that we have, you know, these clear results that say that treaties aren't producing their intended effects, how can the research be furthered? And how do we think it can shape future international treaties? Yeah, so I would go back to this approach of uh, what we call global legal epidemiology. Uh, we have uh, some quantitative evaluations of international laws that we're putting out there, but uh, we also are uh, going into systematic reviews, into uh, mixed methods, qualitative studies, uh, just that there is a new push to have a more empirical approach to evaluating international law. And again, that doesn't mean just quantitative, that just means being systematic, having uh, methods that are appropriate for your research question on a global level. And in the past, we really relied on analyzing uh, maybe one tree at a time or international law within one country. And for those global level considerations, we've mostly relied on people's lived experience, uh, you know, diplomats saying, oh, this happened in the past. And so I'm going to change the way that I negotiate in the future. Uh, and it's not really been done in a systematic way. Uh, so we see a different way of uh, doing things in the future, uh, a more uh, rigorous way of evaluating international law. Uh, and uh, we call that global legal epidemiology, uh, and we're trying to develop it with uh, teams uh, in uh, across different institutions that are, are using this, this new way of evaluating. Awesome. So I want to want to ask, you know, what what got you interested in doing this kind of work and this kind of research? You know, how does one find this this, this as their area of interest? Yeah, uh, for me, I. I come from an epidemiology background. I used to work in vector-borne disease research, and I, uh, I saw that I, what I was working on was really important uh, in, in the various countries where I was working, but I thought, you know, policy really is what matters most uh, to improve uh, people's living standards, the resources available, uh, and to be able to control disease to improve people's well-being. Uh, so I, I went to, to study my, uh, uh, my PhD in health policy, uh, and I realized that, well, there's a lot of issues that can't even be tackled in one country at a time. We need this global cooperation. Uh, issue, again, issues like uh, antimicrobial resistance, like climate change, uh, like uh, plastics. Uh, there's so many that you can't just take one uh, action in one country alone uh, and expect everything to be fine because we need that cooperation at the end of the day. Uh, this is not uh, you know, something that we're taking out of the study that we need to stop trying to cooperate. Definitely not, uh, quite the opposite. So uh, I guess from that evolution, uh, the, appreciating that there are issues that need this global cooperation, what uh, policy options are available, how is international law actually working and applying the most rigorous methods that we have available to us to answer these big questions. Uh, it, it excites me at the, at the end of the day to uh, come in to uh, work and say, uh, we're trying to address these, these massive questions, these difficult questions are really complex, uh, but uh, someone needs to be looking at this because if we don't, then we're just relying on uh, you know, hearsay, personal opinion, and uh, we think that there is a better way. Well, it's certainly wonderful that you're uh, you're beginning you and the team is beginning to explore that. So I'm going to end with a final question, uh, which is based on the conclusions of this study. What insight do you have to share on how to design more effective treaties? I'll go back to the the main conclusions uh, again, just to emphasize uh, enforcement mechanisms. If you're negotiating a non-trade and finance treaty, it seems to be really important to uh, try to include that. Uh, also, the uh, treaty signing uh, uh, process itself, make it into uh, as big of a process, as public of a process, as inclusive of a process as possible. Try to maximize that public intention while you have it. Uh, and uh, we need to maybe look at those trade and finance treaties and say, why are these actually working? Uh, and what can we learn uh, to improve human rights treaties, humanitarian treaties, climate change treaties? Because if we don't, the, the consequences are, are pretty dire. 
Well, thank you very much. That concludes our time today. And we are so very grateful um, for you choosing to, to be with us and, and the alumni and friends community. Thank you. Very welcome. Pleasure. Okay. So you're now welcome, Dr. Parier, to turn off your video and I'll just conclude with some remarks about what's coming up next. Thank you. So for those of you who would like to share today's session with family or friends, it will be posted on our alumni YouTube page. Um, the site is youtube.com slash York U alumni. And you can also go to that site to watch past lectures you may have missed. Uh, we like to finish with one more poll question. So it's gonna come up. How would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following this discussion? So that should pop up on your screen. There it is. So if you can take a moment and let us know what you learned. Fantastic. So what's coming up next for us um, in our the World of Scholars Hub? Our next Scholars Hub at Home session is called Critical Minerals and the Climate. What is at stake in the Ring of Fire? It takes place on Wednesday, October 12th with Dana and Scott, who's an associate professor at the Osgoode Hall Law School and is executive director of the National Network on Environments and Women's Health. You can register for that and learn more about our upcoming sessions as always at yorku.ca forward slash alumni and friends. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn with us and for being a part of the York University community. Wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.